It's been a black day for football. On a sunny afternoon at Hillsborough Sheffield, no fewer than 93 football supporters died in the most tragic accident for the sport ever in this country. Jimmy Hill and I were there, and it becomes the sad duty tonight for those of us normally concerned with the lighter side of television reporting to deal with a somber subject. First of all, of course, our sympathies go to the families of those concerned. But what exactly happened, and vitally important, why? The match, a repeat of last year's FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest, was expected to be another classic. Before it began, though, there were already some indications outside the ground that all was not well. Those already inside were oblivious to these problems, but there was a huge crush outside the Liverpool end, and the police seemed to be getting agitated. FA Cup semi-finals are not a rarity at Hillsborough. There is always something of a crush. But on this particular occasion, things seem to be getting somewhat out of hand. One young boy is released from the pressure. This was all happening about 20 minutes before the kickoff. And as you see, there were still thousands waiting to get into the ground. The mood was not violent, but it was tense. And the police were having some job. This is inside the ground, about 10 minutes before the kickoff, and this is the Liverpool end, and you see the crush. One or two people were already escaping from it, but the match kicked off on time. The players were unconcerned about any problem. They were unaware of it. But within about four minutes of the kickoff, the crowd was spilling onto the pitch behind the Liverpool goal. And within six minutes of the kickoff, a police official decided to approach the referee, Mr. Lewis, and ask for the game to be stopped. Elsewhere on the ground at this stage, we thought that it might just be a pause, a temporary interruption you'll see that the Liverpool fans were quite agitated, explaining to the Liverpool players what was going on. The fans by this time were continuing to spill over onto the pitch. But it was a difficult manoeuvre for most of them. They had to clear the crush barrier. Mr Graham Kelly, the chief executive of the FA, was there. The police didn't seem at this stage to be quite sure of what to do. There's one small gate at the front of that crush barrier which would allow fans onto the pitch. But fans who were crushed up against the barrier couldn't get to it. The gate further down was opened and they could escape the pressure. Others escaped upwards to the seated stand above the terrace. They were helped by fellow Liverpool fans. Down at the front, meantime, the pressure was getting worse. More police arrived, but again, it has to be emphasized, there was no violence of any kind. Elsewhere on the ground, there was some impatience about what was going on. Nobody realized the extent of the problem, that people were being injured and killed. Again, the fans seek refuge above. Again, at this stage, there was no indication elsewhere of the extent of injuries and fatalities. But we were now getting to the stage where clearly the match was unlikely to continue. There was nowhere for the fans who'd come on to the pitch to go. By now, at this stage, I personally had heard from some Liverpool fans having gone down onto the pitch that their friends, their pals, had been injured. I even heard at this stage of somebody being killed but there was no confirmation.
one small boy is thankfully safe. By now, 16 minutes from kickoff, the St. John's ambulance have arrived, and the first ambulance has come onto the pitch. Now, elsewhere in the ground, everybody realizes the severity of the problem. Mr. Peter Robinson, the chief executive of Liverpool, and Kenny Dalgleish, who experienced the Hazel disaster. The crash barrier has now been either broken or cut to allow more fans to escape onto the pitch. More ambulances arrive. And now, almost half an hour from the kickoff of the match, our fans are using the advertising hoardings to help take away the injured and now, we've learned, the dead. By now, the Nottingham Forest fans at the other end are subdued into total silence. They're aware that at the other end, it's not exuberance anymore, it's tragedy. And the managers are told that no game will be played here today. Brian Clough sympathises with Kenny Dalgleish. Morris Rowe, the chairman of Forest, applauds the behaviour of the Forest fans. As soon as we've got rid of all the injured people safely to the hospitals, we won't be able to do that if you rush out to the ground. We'll let you know and you can leave the stadium in safety. The fans listened to that announcement and took their time to leave the ground. Even at this stage, many of them unaware of the fact that people have been injured and killed. This is about half past four in the afternoon now. The Nottingham Forest players are still there. And the sad duty of collecting and taking away the belongings of the injured and dead. And there, walking through on the right, you see the small gate through which some of the fans could escape. And the sad sight of the Liverpool colours tied to a smashed crush barrier. What did you see? Well, I just, I just come on the pitch to do what I could do, is open people out on, on, you know, on the boards from around the ground. And then just people just were lying there with the jumpers they had on or the coast just wrapped down the face, left to one side. and. Everyone was like attending to people like we sort of breathing or attending to breathe. And there was just there was just kids and them fellas just lying there blue. We were in the air, waiting outside, and it was just shocking. It was it was heaving. It was it was it was bad. It wasn't as bad as in there though. And then everyone's saying the to the, everyone everyone's saying there. to the police there was only two mounted horses there. And he was doing they were doing nothing. They were, he, they it were worse. just he was just he was just riding, you know, like riding through people. Like doing doing nothing. Was nothing. The he was just one. doing nothing at all. Did you just open the gates? Like, so so everyone's say, everyone's saying to the to the police, open, open, the gate. like, open them gates. Uh, and there's an official who said, Don't open the gates, and I'll quote him on that. And, you opened them, and, that and he, they opened it and there's about ten thousand people just rushed into it's that little bit. Point. And there was nothing down for you. There was nothing down. I was no, I was lucky. I was lucky. People got in the ground with Full tickets. We should have had that. You should have had, yeah. but yeah. you haven't. Control and there's the 5,000 people, and even more, you've got full tickets that you should have, and you haven't. Yeah, we Is this your worst ever experience in football? Yes, it makes you think, what uh, What are you doing in this industry? It's, it, it is, you know, it's heartbreaking to see a, a youngster, he could be no more than nine, and get trampled. And, you know, I understand he died. It's, you know, it's heartbreaking. What happens now? Well, I don't know. Um, but, I mean, we've had an event which happened in another con <coughs> excuse me in another country. Now we've had it on one of our own grounds, and um, I think we've got to have a rethink. Not about identity card, identity cards or such in this, but um, there's obviously problems. 
mistakes, human mistakes made over admissions. People have been showing me tickets with the counterfoils. I don't think there was any evil violence today. I think it was a natural disaster. I believe that what has happened today has uh, done sport in general a great disservice. Uh, speaking generally, but in particular, I believe that it has put back our return uh, into Europe, as far as football is concerned, many years. I am horrified and disgusted. But at the same time, I must emphasize the fact that I did not see any evidence of bad behavior on the part of Liverpool supporters. Indeed, I saw the reverse. I saw a tremendous amount of enthusiasm before the game. In fact, outside the ground, I was very impressed. There was no sign of any trouble nor was it inside the ground until the invasion took place and people were pushed to the front because I, I think the gates were open to the back. By whom, I don't know. The shock of it all has been mounting ever since. 93 deaths, more than 200 injured. The worst disaster ever in British sport. By 7 o'clock this evening, the South Yorkshire Police had arranged a press conference. The Chief Constable is Mr Peter Wright. As I understand it, there was... Um major pressure on the turnstiles at the Leppings Lane entrance when three or four thousand people who arrived at the ground uh, within five ten minutes of the kickoff were endeavouring to gain entry. It, you, you will understand that the opening of the gate and the surge on the ground are two as I am aware too and I, I think that it would be wrong for me to discuss the detail of it at this stage because I might give the wrong impression and that would be uh, uh, incorrect to do so. The gate was opened at police direction. I am not aware of any connection between the opening of the gate and the surge on the terrace. I am aware, as I've said, that there was a, a, about three, th three to four thousand people outside the Leppings Lane stand and there was danger to life outside as perceived by the police. There was, that, that is the turnstile. Outside the turnstile there is another gate and in order to restrict the pressure on the turnstiles, that gate was shut. Um, I understand it was, uh, it was forced open and the, and the crush continued. We are at this stage conducting a coroner's inquiry. Well, Mr Wright then made himself available to further questions put by Gerald Sinstad. Chief Constable, you've already outlined basically what happened. If I can just briefly summarise the cause of the tragedy seems to have been a major surge shortly after the kickoff. But you don't know exactly what caused that surge. No, I don't. There was, you say, the arrival of a large number of people shortly before the game was due to begin. Yes. And well, when I say arrival, the position was about 10 minutes before the match. There were about three to 4,000 people seeking to get access through the Lemmings Lane turnstile and the crush outside was very great and the officers who were handling that particular section of the ground were concerned about the possibility of injury and fatality to people who were being crushed at the turnstile. They eased as they could that pressure by first of all closing the, uh, the gates, the perimeter gates outside the turnstiles and then allowing the crowd at the front of the turnstiles to come to the side and a gate was opened, a concertina gate, and a number of people were admitted to the ground through the gate. Some of them apparently without having their ticket, tickets checked. Well, I don't know. I, th th that has been said. I would have expected that there would have been a check on the tickets. I wouldn't have expected that people would have been, uh, if, if the reason for doing it was to, uh, because of a perceived possibility of uh, fatality or injury, that the ticket becomes slightly less important than, than the objective that caused the gate to be open. Um, the gate was at the side. There was no, there, there was no uh, surge through in the sense that the gates were suddenly wide open. There was, as I understand it, a con fairly controlled access of a relatively small number of people. Looking at it from the main stand, the central area behind the goal was very densely packed and the two wings were fairly lightly occupied is there separate access to those three areas? I'm not sure. It would be. It would. It, I think perhaps there there are two uh, entrances to that particular stand, um, the west stand. I think the, the Leppings Lane stand. I think there are two entrances. 
um, that they, they congregate behind the goals is perhaps understood. But my information, again, is that that stand was not over capacity, that there was capacity for at least another two or 3,000 people to go in. And that is confirmed by the record, as I understand it again, of the computer controlled access at the ground. The crucial question, presumably, will be how much work was being done to shepherd them out of the central area into the wings. Yes, I, I, I think the whole nature of that quarter of an hour or 50, uh, 20 minutes obviously will be the focal point of much attention and there will be inquiries to establish exactly what happened. But at this stage I must emphasize that, that I have no information that gives a direct connection between uh, the surge in the ground and the incident outside. For the very best of reasons you made the decision to allocate the ends as you did uh, there was a certain amount of criticism saying that Liverpool is the better supported club ought to have been at the other end. With hindsight, would you do it differently? I don't think it... Th I mean, if you were telling me that that was a factor in the event, I don't think it was. There would be tickets allocated to Liverpool and Liverpool would have been given that particular stand. The reasoning that went into the decision as to who had the Leppings Lane stand and who had the other end is a matter that I wasn't directly involved in, but I presume that all the factors were weighed. If Liverpool had had the uh, other stand, then the Nottingham Forest supporters would have had this one. one you, you, can't, uh, you can't mix them, and therefore there are only two ends, so one team gets one end and the other team gets the other. I don't know whether there was a conscious decision to limit the number of uh, tickets to Liverpool as opposed to Nottingham Forest. I shouldn't have thought so. After the Bradford fire disaster, I thought it was established that there should be a facility for gates in the protective fencing to allow the public to spill onto the pitch to avoid exactly what happened today. What facility is there of that kind at Hillsborough? Hillsborough is one of the uh, best uh, constructed and organised grounds in the country as far as I'm aware. Otherwise the, the FA would not continually allow these major matches to take place there. All the people who are involved in the safety of sports grounds, all those who consider these factors, are quite satisfied with the situation that applies at Hillsborough. But are there gates in that fence along behind that door? We, we're getting into detail now. I think there must be, but, but for me to, uh, to enter into detail about the number of gates and, and the availability of them might be misleading, and I wouldn't wish to do that. The Chief Constable of South Yorkshire, Mr Peter Wright there. Well, now joining us from Hillsborough is Mr Graham McCrell, the Secretary of uh, Sheffield Wednesday. It's been a terrible day all round, not least for your club, of course, Graham. Uh, yes, obviously all of us here at Hillsborough are absolutely devastated by the events of today. What would you have to say about the opening of that gate by the police that we've just heard about? D is it your supposition that people came into the ground that ought not to have been there, people without tickets or people with forged tickets? We've got no evidence that people who got into the ground either had forged tickets or in fact weren't in possession of tickets. But obviously it's too early to comment further on that matter. Why do you suppose there was such a crush outside the ground? I mean, you, you consistently hold FA Cup semi-finals. This problem hasn't happened outside the ground seemingly before. Why did it happen this time? Was it not well policed, did you feel? I think it was uh, policed as, as was last year. Really, it obviously is a repeat of last year's semi-final, but it, uh, it seemed to appear from looking at the counter on the computer that the, the Nottingham Forest supporters were into the ground very early but the Liverpool supporters were very much delayed. Whether that was by traffic or whatever, I'm not really sure at this stage, but it definitely was the situation that there was a great build-up of Liverpool supporters trying to gain access to the ground, uh, getting nearer to kick-off time. Is it your feeling that the police seem to transfer a problem outside the ground to, to one in the ground by, by opening the gate? Well, obviously, the police uh, took uh, the actions which they did at the time for the reasons they did, the best possible motives, but obviously that will be the subject of some further inquiry and uh, we will know, know in the future of you know, the whys and wherefores of the event. Sure. What, can I just ask you one question about the gate onto the pitch uh, fr from the, 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 the barrier at the front there? It's a very narrow gate. Um, it didn't allow many people to get through, hence they were climbing over or being pulled up. Um, have you got a comment to make about that? Well, only that um, the gate is uh, regularly tested. It conforms to the requirements of the local safety committee, obviously, under the terms of the Safety of Sports Grounds Act. Mm. One other uh, uh, comment from you. Um, I was there this afternoon and we, we spoke. Um, 
I got the feeling that the, the crowd elsewhere in the ground got very impatient with what was going on for some considerable time because they weren't informed about the severity of the situation. No announcements were made for an awful while. Well, I understand that the reason for that was obviously to allow the emergency service vehicles access into the ground and the ambulances to get away from the ground because if there was obviously a statement made that the game was to be abandoned, it was felt that the, the neighbouring roads could actually be blocked and would hamper the rescue vehicles. Graham, thank you very much for the moment. I believe Graham Kelly is alongside you uh, there, the chief executive of the FA. Uh, Graham, an, uh, an awful day. Uh, who decides on the allocation of tickets? The Liverpool complaint by all the fans that I spoke to there today was that they didn't get enough tickets and they were saddled, as it were, with the wrong end of the ground for the second year running. That uh, they have more supporters than Nottingham Forest, they had fewer tickets and they were in the cramped end of the ground. Who decides on that? Well, the Football Association decide that, but they act in accordance with uh, the advice received from Sheffield Wednesday Club and from the local police and it's the police who dictate uh, which clubs occupy which ends because of the traffic flow situation it's as simple as that we are in the hands of the police as far as that is concerned what's the FA's reading of the, of the police handling of the situation there today oh, I think it's much too early to say um, we, we need to ascertain precisely the reasons for this terrible tragedy before we make any comment about the actions of anybody involved we really do uh, Mr. Bert Millerchip uh, is, is down at Birmingham, who was uh, watching the other semi-final there today. Uh, Mr. Millerchip, I've, I've heard it said, even suggested, that perhaps the competition should now be abandoned after today's tragedy. What would the FA's uh, feeling be about that? Uh, that's the first intimation that I've had that uh, such a suggestion has been made. Uh, but that would be a matter for consideration uh, very early next week, I'm quite sure. Uh, I would anticipate that there's no uh, immediate intention of this match being played. I'm talking about the match between uh, uh, Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. Uh, I would anticipate there would be a delay in any event, uh, perhaps for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. before that match would be involved. I, other than that, I've, uh, I, I really would, could not comment at the moment. Um, the week began rather optimistically for uh, the possibility of English football returning to Europe. And although there was no actual crowd violence as such here today, um, it will hardly give us confidence about ever getting back in again, the fact that this whole situation seemed to be rather mismanaged by some parties, or what are your feelings about that? Well, I don't know that mismanage is the right word, and neither do I believe that we were too optimistic about what happened in the early part of the week. Indeed, I believe there was too much euphoria about the decision that was taken out in uh, Lisbon. As far as I could see, the situation today is much the same as it was prior to that meeting. Uh, but so far as today is concerned, uh, I can only say that uh, I looked and heard uh, on television uh, only in the last two hours with utter dismay and almost belief, uh, shock and horror. Uh, uh, and it's, it, is, it really is another nail in the coffin into the football world. Uh, there are suggestions that a match of this importance and that's going to attract rather more people than there are tickets available for should perhaps not be held uh, at a ground like Hillsborough, although you've held so many semi-finals there before, that they should now be perhaps transferred to Wembley. Well, I think that's a totally relevant at this mo at, uh, for today. Uh, this was an all-ticket match, uh, and uh, the Nottingham Forest uh, fans had so many tickets to get into their end of the ground, and that applied also to the Liverpool fans. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the allocation was precisely, but uh, it was all ticket, and uh, presumably the powers that be, uh, who made the decision, issued enough tickets for the Liverpool fans to get in at that end. Uh, it would it, it would be it could be suggested that a number of fans turned up at the ground without tickets. Now uh, I say it could be. Uh, there's been a suggestion tonight that there were some forged tickets. Uh, uh, this is a matter for the inquiry. Mm. Can I just go back to Graham Kelly at, um, at Hillsborough just for a moment there? Um, Graham, what about the, the, the barriers that prevent fans getting onto the pitch? Have we now got to rethink this whole situation about doing something to make them easily collapsible? They seem to be the, the root cause of injury and death today, that people could not escape the crush, could not easily get onto the pitch, could not find the small door, had to either climb over or be hauled up. 
Well, quite simply, Des, we're, we're in the hands of the safety experts, we're in the hands of the local authorities who issue the safety certificates, we're in the hands of the people who know technically re the requirements as, as far as keeping crowds segregated and controlled are concerned. And if the, if the situation needs to be reassessed in the light of what happened today, then so be it. But some, some local authorities... Well, don't you think it needs to be reassessed? Well, I don't know. Some local authorities insist upon perimeter fencing. Other local authorities insist that there is no perimeter fencing. Um, we, we, we'll just have to wait and see whether that conclusion will be drawn from today's terrible incident. Thank you for the moment. Um, I understand that the Minister for Sport, uh, Mr. Colin Moynihan, uh, has been at Hillsborough this evening and uh, made an inspection of both the pitch and the terrace situation earlier on. You see him on the left there. This is about half an hour ago at Hillsborough. He arrived by helicopter to inspect the situation and I'm sure, uh, knowing him, will play a very prominent role in the investigation of the whole situation and will be very involved uh, in future investigations about it. Graham Kelly accompanied him there. Mr Moynihan wasn't actually at the match himself today but flew in there this evening to check on the situation. We will probably get a comment uh, with him in a moment if we can. But now Jimmy Hill was alongside me at the match today and uh, of course is as horrified like I am and like you are and everybody else is about the whole situation. The extraordinary thing there today, Jimmy, was that we sort of sat back and thought this would be a sort of temporary pause in the proceedings mm. to begin with, didn't we? We weren't to know of the horrors uh, to come. No idea for some time that, that such a disaster had occurred. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've observed football and, and, and everything to do with it for so long. Uh, where does this leave us now? Where does this leave the game, do you think, after something like this? Well, I think the important thing to establish is that it's not hooligan-related. I mean, this wasn't a, a direct result of hooliganism. I mean, that's the first thing to substantiate. You can say um, impatience and fanaticism, perhaps, outside the ground and, you know, for the game, but not direct hooliganism. That's the first thing. And the second thing, not that we want to do the inquiry here tonight, but it does seem logically from where we were sitting that at the start of the game, that end was tight, but it wasn't impossible. Mm. And all of a sudden, it appears gates were opened, and there wasn't a rush immediately, we've heard that, but the pressure must have come from somewhere on the back of that central section at that end. Yes, and that's what did the damage. Yes, it would appear, I think the police have admitted that they opened a gate to allow the fans into the ground to, to solve a crush that was going on outside the ground. It yeah. remains to be seen why there was such a crush uh, that wasn't managed or didn't appear to be managed terribly well outside the ground, whereas in previous years that, that crush outside has been has been managed. One point I did pick up today, which we both did, was that, that there was no public address control, really. There, not an announcement whether the game was going to be continued, but some kind of um, conversation with the crowd, because there could have been further nastiness, really, uh, at the other end, because the Nottingham Forest supporters there, like us when it started, had no idea of the severity of the problem. And they were doing their chance, you know, innocently, really, uh, thinking that things were normal and so I mean not only Sheffield Wednesday but I think all clubs in this country are antiquated in the contact that they have through the voice of the club with their spectators the systems are antiquated they don't work and they're not used properly to the best effect that's something we can positively learn today the Nottingham Forest supporters and everybody else there who was outside of the immediate danger area should have known what a disaster had occurred and you would have got a totally different reaction then um, you know, fr from that moment so on. So non-information yeah. was a problem there today. Well, yeah. just for the moment, let's go and hear what Colin Moynan had to say after his inspection. Uh, I suspect that uh, there was a mad scramble around him to get some answers. Okay. Oh, oh, Colin, just start, start off by no. saying that... Uh, no. No, no. Our hearts and minds go up to all the families and uh, friends of the dead and the injured. It's an appalling tragedy. These were great young supporters, most of them of football and their club. It was good to see the way in which so many of their friends, other supporters, went to their assistance and the 
effectiveness of the special police services and the ambulance services who went to their aid. But tonight, everybody in the country must be feeling very deeply and grieving the loss. Indeed, the whole world of sport, uh, both here and internationally, uh, must be grieving the appalling loss of life here of young people who should indeed be still alive and uh, who have been so tragically killed today. Mr. Colin, Moore, can I ask you, do you have an explanation yet for happened? how it happened? No. Of course, at such an early stage, there's uh, a great deal of detail to be considered. Uh, tonight, I just wanted to come out here particularly to be with those um, friends and relatives who've come across in order to offer them the sympathy and the support that everybody in this country will wish to offer them. It, it's far too early to speculate on any of the detail, and it would, in fact, in my view, be grossly improper so to do. To begin with, we're talking about the loss of life, and we should be very much concerned about those people and offer the privacy, which I hope the press will give to the families and friends of those people. And then, in due course, we must obviously start studying in detail um, the reasons behind this to make sure it never happens. Mr. What Moynihan, about looking at the about Colin Moynihan uh, at Hillsborough just a few moments ago. Jimmy, do you have a, a final comment on this tragic day? We're a funny old nation. In the early 80s at Coventry City, we created an all-seater stadium right, where something like this couldn't have happened. And the local paper you know, campaigned with the public to say they wanted to stand up at football matches. I wonder whether those who were there today would want to stand up again in the future. The best thing we can do for the memory of those who've died today is to change the face of our soccer stadia in this country and build a monument to them that's decent and clean and where that kind of thing can't happen. Thank you, Jimmy. Well, this was to have been a sports program. You will understand that on a day of such momentous tragedy, it would be inappropriate to show football action. Everton, of course, beat Norwich 1-0 in the other semi-final from us. Good night. <laughs>